morning, everybody. I'm prone to uh, long introductions, so go ahead and take a seat. So, you know, I'm not going to do it to you. Care about you too much. But thank you so much again for the opportunity to preach God's word this morning as we continue our series during Reformation Month. Our text today is from Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, 10 to 14. Galatians chapter 3, 10 to 14. So far, we have gone over Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace alone, and today we will go over the need for faith alone. And then next week, our pastor Chris will conclude us with the glory of God alone. These truths are some of the most basic, the essentials, if you will, to confessing the Christian creed. These are the things that quite frankly separate our faith our religion from all other false religions. And also from this very pulpit, and many times I've been asked for one reason or another, what is the most unpopular Christian belief? And there are many who think it can be our teaching on marriage and various other things, but sometimes I think this particular teaching is one of the more unpopular beliefs that the church holds to. We live in a psychologized, self-esteem-oriented world, and we all want to feel good about ourselves and have a sense in which we have done something, even if it's only a fraction of something, to be made right before God. Yet faith alone teaches the exact opposite. We will see first in our text our inability to make ourselves right before God, and then how faith frees us from that very unbearable burden to live in love with God. We will see then and see and reflect on how Christ Jesus redeems us from the curse we all bear through his self-sacrificial love. And lastly, we will focus on what we receive through the instrument of faith in his promised spirit. But the main point or the proposition of this sermon this morning is very simple. Trust in Jesus. I now invite you to rise for the reading of God's holy word. I want to remind you, as we do every Sunday, that there's only one place in the entire universe where you can go to find absolute truth, and it is the Bible, the very Word of God. It is all inspired by Him. It is an error, which means it has no error, so what it says is true is true, and it is infallible, I mean, it will never, ever fail you, so you can trust it completely. Now hear the Word of the Lord. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. This is the word of the Lord, and the people said, you, you may be seated. Will you please join me in going to the Lord in prayer? Gracious and merciful Father, our almighty Lord and Savior, Father, we know that there truly is no one like the true God. You are almighty, you are all-powerful, and you are all that is good. Every good thing is wrapped up and finds its perfection in you. You are all-loving and all-merciful and all-gracious. When we think of love, we ought to think of you. And Lord, may you, through your Holy Spirit, convey the truth and the beauty of that love here to all of your saints. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said in the intro, the very first thing that everybody wants to do is to have a works-based righteousness to some degree, but the first main point is the opposite of that. It is not by works that we are saved. This is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult thing, for the world to accept and acknowledge is the fact that they are so sinful that they can never restore themselves to being good or to being right before God. Yet there will always be those 
in every generation who tell themselves that there are things they can do to fix the situation. And that is exactly what Paul is addressing here in Galatians 3. Before we can really understand how to live by faith, we must thoroughly understand its opposite and reject it. Its opposite, of course, is to engage in works righteousness. So what is works righteousness? Well, very simply, it is the misguided and frankly arrogant belief that there are things I can do to earn heaven and have a right standing before God. The notion that obeying the law, doing good things, being a decent and nice person, a good sort of person, by whatever standard that may be, earns me, I, I deserve heaven from God. This will get me to where I want to be when it is my time to go. But that's foolish. It's foolish because, as the good Apostle Paul is about to explain, this sort of thinking, this kind of argument, represents a fundamental misreading of the law. The Judaizers, those who he is referring to, and all others who cling to works-based rationalists don't rightly read the law, and those who do never come to such a conclusion. Especially since, as we are about to see, that is not why the law was written anyway. And so the law shows in full light our true standing before God on our own. As Paul says, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The main thing to take away from this verse is all things. Do all things. Paul is saying that if you want to do works righteousness as the Judaizers want you to do, if you insist that one should have to keep the law and be circumcised to keep kosher and to do all the things that come with it, you better really do all things that come with it. You better do every single thing. Leave no stone unturned. Every, dot, every I better be dotted and every T better be meticulously crossed. And the reason for that is unlike us, God is perfectly just. This means when on Judgment Day you stand before His throne, the triumph God is going to look at the book of the law and see if you have kept it, and is going to judge you accordingly. Do you honestly think you will get it past the very first law? Well, if you do, then I have to say your lack of self-awareness is utterly astounding, to say the least. So let's start with the most important commandment of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Have you perfectly kept this command? I think the honest answer is no. Thomas Schreiner, who was a teacher at Southern Seminary, was asked one time in an interview to define sin, and he said, I define sin as a fundamental refusal to glorify God and praise God as God. So have you ever sinned? Well, every time you sin, you're refusing to honor God and praise God as God. All sin is fundamentally a refusal to obey the very first commandment. This is the essence of the fall. I can be my own God and I can be my own Savior. I can be the master of my own life. And if we're being honest, haven't we all said that at some point or another in our lives? Have you ever sought your own glory? Then you have sinned, violated the law and character of God, and broken the very first and greatest commandment. This means you are guilty of not keeping the law perfectly. There isn't any point to examining whether you kept the second part of it, because unless your obedience is universal, you may not enter the presence of a holy and just God. Not some, not most, but all. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and my rules and do them. Then the land where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. God was speaking through Moses to the Israelites about the promised land. How much more would a perfectly just God apply this to the kingdom of heaven? This is why we need to see our need to trust in Jesus. The way to do this is instead of walking before God, telling ourselves that we deserve something for our good deeds, is living by faith. 
it is also important to see that this is nothing new since Paul is quoting the Old Testament and previously used the Old Testament figure of Abraham to make the point about living in faith or by faith, which is to live trusting God. Paul quotes here from Habakkuk 2 in the verse which says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. We have already seen how no one can be justified before a holy God based on their own merits. But what does it mean to live by faith? Well, it starts by learning what it means to be justified by faith. And we learn that by looking at the New Testament example of Abraham. Abraham was someone the Lord made many promises to. He was to be a father of many nations, that a great nation would be made from him, and that the Lord would bless him and multiply him and all of these wonderful things. Yet there were times when this seemed unlikely. Abraham becomes a very old person before he receives his promised son and does not live to see all that was promised to him by God. But the scriptures tell us about and highly commend Abraham's faith for a reason. The scripture saying, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham was counted as righteous, not because of his good deeds, not because he was perfect. And if you read Genesis, you'll see Abraham had his faults, but because he trusted in the word. He trusted in the promises of God. Faith is simply strong, confident trust in the word and promises of God. It is knowing that what God says is true really is true. It is trusting in the character of God who keeps all his promises. This is what justifies the saints. God faithfully and unfailingly keeping his promises to us. Abraham knew that God would keep his promises, and we ought to know that God will keep his promises to us as well, and that we should rest in these promises. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Saving faith, the kind of faith that I hope we all want to have, is knowing that this promise is for you and completely trusting in it. It is the ability given by God's grace to confidently say, I believe that Jesus is God is true as much as I know that the sky outside is blue. The sheep, as it says, know his voice. They follow it, believe it, trust it, and rest in it. The same way a little child knows the sound of his mother's voice and immediately wants to go to that voice when he is hurt and when he hears his mom picking him up from school. We, the sheep, know the voice of the Good Shepherd is the voice of the one who loves us with perfect, everlasting love. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, says the Lord. And as the gospel says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The sheep go to his voice with all the trust a child has for his mother or father. Do good parents make their children feel like they have to earn the love and affection of their parents, to earn the right to be in the family? No. They just love their children. Faith alone is knowing God's love is for you just because he loves you. Faith alone is trusting in God's promise as a child trusts his parents and resting in their heavenly father's goodness towards him. It is this type of trust that we have. So trust in Jesus. Further, while we trust in Jesus' goodness, mercy and grace toward us we also know and trust that jesus as god and king is just that god's justice must and will be satisfied genuine christians trust that this has been satisfied by the work of jesus because christ redeems there are two terms reformed theologians have used to describe how this redemptive work takes place these terms are the passive and active obedience of christ 
the active obedience of Christ is Jesus' positive fulfilling of the law, meaning the fact that he never sinned, that he lived righteously. The passive obedience is his self-sacrifice, his atonement, his work on the cross, and our text emphasizes that one more. Our passage has made it clear already that all under the law are under a curse for having not perfectly kept the law. As we all know well, we have failed to keep the law perfectly, and as the scriptures teach elsewhere, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of laugh, like the rest of mankind. Whether you were born middle class, upper class, or working class, this describes all of humanity. We have all lived a life of sin, and sin merits a punishment. But the amazing thing about the Gospels, it tells us that God takes this punishment, this curse, on himself. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. This is the passive obedience of Jesus Christ. Redemption, in its origins, points to the idea of a payment made to set sinners free. The word has its origins in ancient warfare, when after a military defeat, those in the homeland of the defeated would raise money and pay to set them free. In a similar way, Jesus, who was totally innocent, became a curse for us to redeem us from having failed to keep the law by paying the debt of sin that we owed. Christ took on the penalty we deserve. He took on the wrath that we deserve, not for himself, not to prove how good he was or how gracious he happens to be. Jesus takes on the wrath of God the Father against all sin, separated from the love of God the Father for us. It is completely selfless. Jesus takes on the wrath of God the Father against all sin and is separate from the love of God for us. Imagine having a perfectly loving and harmonious relationship with someone where you are always understood and cared for endlessly and without fail. You're able to be totally vulnerable with this person. You could share any and everything about yourself with this person and then have that taken away from you and experience this person's wrath so that others could enjoy his love too. This is what Jesus had to endure on the cross for our sakes. Martin Luther says, Paul does not say that Christ was made a curse for himself. The accent is on the two words for us. Christ is personally innocent. Personally, he did not deserve to be hanged for any crime of his own doing. But because Christ took the place of others who were sinners, he was hanged like any other transgressor. transgressor. Whatever sins I, you, all of us have committed or shall commit, they are Christ's sins, as if he had committed them himself. Our sins have to be Christ's sins, or we shall perish forever. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That is the passive obedience of Christ. His suffering on our behalf that he endured both on the cross, his taking up of our sins on himself like a lamb without blemish, and then defeating sin, paying the penalty once and for all, redeeming us for himself. Faith, trust, allows us to see this truth and completely embrace it for the salvation of our souls. Christ has suffered in my place so that his righteousness, his justice, his justice can be satisfied in him. As the scriptures say, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. And further, through Christ's act of obedience and fully obeying the law and living a righteous life without any sin, he fully redeems us there as well. So he takes on the curse we deserve and gives us the blessing we don't deserve through his perfect righteousness. As he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the beautiful truth of the gospel that Jesus, the Son of Man, came down from the glories and majesty of heaven, not to condemn the world, but to save and redeem sinners. That is the gospel that we place our faith in. We place our faith in the righteousness and sacrifice of Jesus. So trust 
in Jesus. Yet we cannot truly place our trust in Jesus without this one last thing. I alluded to the blessing specifically mentioned in the first half of verse 14, which reads, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. But what is this promised blessing? Well, it is his promised spirit. As the text says, that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is perhaps one of the most neglected graces and truths we as the church have received, which is really very unfortunate because the gift of God's Holy Spirit is one of the best blessings we ever can receive. It is certainly far, far higher than any of the temporary earthly blessings Abraham had waited for. It is better than the land of Israel. It is better than the kingship of David. It is better than any earthly thing that you want right now. The promised spirit is one of the central blessings given to us in the new covenant and was so long waited for prior to Jesus. If you don't believe me, hear these words from the prophets. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants, says Isaiah. And I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules, says Ezekiel. And as Moses once said, with that all the Lord's people were prophets that the Lord would put his spirit on them. I hope you can begin to see this gift, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that occurred in Acts 2, that occurred at Pentecost as more, much more than just some historical moment in church history, but a pivotal moment of blessing for his saints. The church received forgiveness and redemption from sin in Christ and then received the living presence of God through the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, there is no evidence of saving faith or reason to believe one has saving faith at all. The Westminster Confession says of saving faith, the grace of faith whereby the elect are unable to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. It is only through the Holy Spirit that we receive the gift of saving faith. It is only through the Spirit that we believe and trust in the promises of God. It is only the Spirit that causes our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive Christ's redeeming grace and love. It is the Spirit that causes believers to see and believe in the beauty and salvation of Christ, to know He belongs to Jesus, and that Jesus is His for all eternity. It is the Spirit working in faith that causes us to love Jesus and see that Jesus loved us before the foundation of the world, at creation, in the first century, in the first century now, and forever. A natural man in his natural state, no matter how smart or wise he may think he is, does not and cannot receive this truth, for the Bible says the Spirit must interpret the Spirit, and the Spirit is what causes belief. Faith. Trust is God's chosen instrument to receive the Holy Spirit, which brings us to new life and salvation in Christ. It is through faith and the Spirit that we know all the promises in God are truly yes and amen. As John Owen says, the preaching of the gospel gives birth to faith in them, enabling them to receive the Spirit. So believing is put as the qualification for our receiving the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is only believers who receive the Holy Spirit, and they receive Him by faith. Faith receives the Spirit as the Spirit promised in the covenant of grace. Faith takes hold of the promises, and we receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. So the receiving of the Spirit through faith is receiving Him as promised. So you see, faith alone is God's instrument in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit to accept all the wonderful truths and graces of Scripture alone, Christ alone, and grace alone. It is the Spirit working through faith that enables us to acknowledge the Scriptures as true, Christ's redeeming work as needed and completed and given to us by grace. And we lay hold to these truths through faith alone, all for His glory that He rightly and justly deserves. It is only through the gift of faith alone that we can say 
yes and amen with the Apostle John, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Here's your takeaway for those outside of Christ. Receive the Spirit. I, Chris, the elders, the deacons, no one here can make you a Christian. My preaching is not what saves you. It is the triune God alone through the Father's love, through the Son's redemptive work, and through the Spirit's sanctifying and life-giving grace that makes you a Christian. Receive the Spirit for the gift of eternal life. For those in Christ, trust. It was the main point for the entire sermon, so I hope the point has been made perfectly clear. We are not saved for any good works on our own. Though we are saved for good works, even those good works are the work of God himself. So trust in Jesus for your salvation and your sanctification until he calls you home. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, you truly are an amazing, kind, gracious Lord. Father, we deserve nothing from you, and yet you wake us up every morning and you bestow your kindnesses and graces on all of us. But above all, your Son redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we could be with you, that we could be your children and receive all of the truths of Scripture alone, grace alone, Christ alone, and faith alone, not because of any good work in us, but because you are a perfectly, infinitely loving God. May we walk away knowing that better and praising you more for the love you have given to us that we don't deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.